continuing with the sticky note lecture for chapter 5, starting on page 125. <coughs> page 125 talks about phylogenetic trees that you do not have to know for my class or the AP test, so skip it. And the following page, um, you don't have to know anything from this page as well. The, um, you do, however, have to know about that some species are more vulnerable to extinction. And this page on 127 tells you a little bit why. You do need to know the word endemic, which means it's a species found only in one place on Earth. Some examples. The book gives you um, the example of the Yosemite toad. Again, it's only found in the high Sierras around Yosemite National Park. There's another one that's found in Santa Clarita in our river, the Santa Clara River. It's called the unarmored three-spined stickleback fish. It's pretty small. It's only about an inch, about an inch long, and it's an endangered fish, actually. Um, it is endemic to our river, the Santa Clara River. Now some of you might be a little confused because you're thinking, well, there's no water in the river most of the year. Well, there's actually water in the river starting at about Magic Mountain and then flowing down through Fillmore and Piru. We treat our wastewater, our sewage water, down all our drains at the Valencia Reclamation Plant, which is right by Magic Mountain off the old road and the treated, cleaned up water, which is safe and clean, gets um, dumped into the river at that point in time. So that's really where the fish lives from there into the ocean where there is year-round water. The next page um, talks about some of the extinctions and the asteroids extinctions. What you need to know is that there have been five previous mass extinctions, and we are currently in the sixth mass extinction, that is human cost. On the next page, we have, this is page 130, we have the levels of organization from biosphere, ecosystem, community, population, organism. Know this chart for your next test. You especially need to be aware of two terms, well, three terms. Population is a group of one species. For example, the population of coyotes in Santa Clarita. A scientist could be studying that population. If we're going to talk about the coyotes plus the bunny rabbits that they eat, plus the lizards and the bugs and the bacteria that decompose the coyotes' scat, which is their poop, then we can talk about the community. If we list all of the living things in Santa Clarita, that would be the community, biologically speaking, of Santa Clarita. If we're going to include not just the living things, but also the weather, the rainfall, the soil type, which are abiotic factors, then we are referring to an ecosystem. So the ecosystem, the ecosystem of Santa Clarita includes all the living things and the non-living things in an environment. Mm -hmm. Students often get these three terms mixed up. Don't be one of those students. Make sure you know and study the difference between these three terms. Page 131 talks about the difference between a generalist and a specialist. A coyote is a generalist. It can eat lots of different kinds of foods. It can live in lots of different kinds of environments, like neighborhoods and wilderness and the desert and the forest and the plains. A polar bear, however, is a specialist because it only lives in the tundra up around the North Pole and only eats things it captures from the ice, like seals. So if the ice disappears with climate change, then the polar bears perhaps might become endangered or go extinct because 
they're w they won't be able to eat or live if that specific specific environment or food source is gone. So specialists again are more likely to become endangered or extinct. On this page it shows an example of an extinct species. The passenger pigeon was once abundant but it is now extinct. This is page 132. Page 133, population distribution. Make sure you know the difference between random, uniform, and clumped on this page. And there's three pictures that show that for you. Page 134 has some pictures of um, population age structure diagrams. We will study these a lot in Chapter 8 when we study human population. So for right now, we're not going to... Uh, we're just going to postpone talking about these. The next page shows a diagram here of survivorship curve. shows that humans have a low death rate when they're young and a high death rate when they're old. Type 2 species, oh, type 1, by the way, are also kind of your big mammals that have type 1, like gorillas and elephants um, and tigers they all have a type 1 survivorship curve. Live when you're young um, and die when you're old. Type 2, there's an equal death rate, um, young and old. Type 3 species, you have a high death rate when you're young, and if you happen to make it to adulthood, you live for a long time. Think of a frog. A frog lays hundreds of eggs, and they turn into tadpoles, but they're food for lots of other species. Species eat these tadpoles. Sometimes they dry up. And so out of a hundred, there might be only one that survives to adulthood. But if that frog does live to adulthood, it's going to live a long time, ten years maybe. Plants and trees are all type three. Plants give out hundreds, thousands of seeds. And very few make it to, um, to grow and become adults. Think of an oak tree. An oak tree um, produces thousands of acorns, and maybe only one lives. The rest get eaten by birds and squirrels and things like that. But once that oak tree lives and reaches maturity, it will live for 100, 200 years. So that's a survivorship curve, type 1. You live when you're young, you die when you're old. Type 2, equal death rates for young or old. Type 3, high death rate when you're young, low death rate when you're old. Turning the page, 136. Make sure you understand what exponential growth is. And we often call it a J-curve. So organisms undergo exponential growth when there's no limiting factors, and we call it a J-curve. So what that means is that populations will multiply. Exponential means multiplying growth. You go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. So you're not just adding two at a time. You're multiplying, and it, you grow very, very quickly in population. But that is not normal in nature. Populations are limited by water, space, food, predators, and disease, which um, in essence pushes down their population to what's called a carrying capacity. Make sure you know this caption right here, the caption and the picture. And so most populations of species exhibit logistic growth. Populations are limited by food, space, predators, etc. at their carrying capacity. And we call this kind of curve an S-curve. It kind of makes this weird-looking S. So you need to know that J-curve is exponential growth, and S-curve is logistic growth. And this top line here represents the carrying capacity, which is the highest number of that species um, an ecosystem can support with food, shelter, water, or diseases come in, etc. Now, limiting factors can be defined as two different kinds. On this page, you need to know that we have density-independent limiting factors, 
and density dependent limiting factors. For your test, make sure you know the difference between these two. Density independent factors limit a population but are not dependent on the size or the density of the population. These things are like a flood wipes out a population, a landslide. Those things just happened. It had nothing to do with the size or how close they were together. But sometimes things come in that um, when you get too many of a population, then they run out of uh, space, they run out of food, and that can limit the size of your population. Those things happen because there's a lot of the population, and we call that a high density, so it's density dependent factors. The graphs up here are important to know. They show different ways that species can come to or not come to their carrying capacity. This is a nice logistic S curve here. And at the top here is the carrying capacity. This is as much um, the highest population that um, this of yeast cells of this environment, whether it's a petri dish or something, can handle. After this, it runs out of food, it runs out of space, something like that. This beetle eventually will get to its carrying capacity. If we draw a line, it kind of will get to it eventually. It kind of goes above and below and above and below and above and below, but less and less each time and eventually will get to its carrying capacity. This particular population of reindeer went up in a J curve, an exponential growth here, but it actually went too high. And um, because it went too high, in fact, I think there was no predators at this point in time. Um, so the predators didn't limit it at a carrying capacity. It should have been limited. It went up so high that they all starved to death and they crashed. And so this one still hasn't really reached its carrying capacity yet because of other factors. On this page, we have the difference between R-selected and K-selected species. Please read through this list. We are K-selected. Um, we are large compared to like a mouse or you know, a seed. We have slow development. It takes us 18 years to get to adulthood. We live a long time. We reproduce later in life. We have few large offspring. We don't have very many children per, um, per female. We have lots of parental care. On this side, think of mice. Think of plants. Think of um, animals that are kind of prey animals. They produce a lot. They're usually smaller. They're short-lived, reproduce early, um, fast population growth, a lot of off small offspring. Um, again, these are usually things that are eaten by other species, are usually R-selected. Usually R-selected has a type 3 survivorship curve and usually K-selected has a type 1 survivorship curve. You need to know biotic potential, and that's basically the potential for producing a lot of offspring. Okay, the last thing in this chapter is on page 143. Make sure you read through and understand and be able to write about ecotourism. That's the end of what you need to know for chapter 5.